Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's shop talk. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Lindsay Harris. I'm the professor of the School of Classical Studies here at the Academy. And tonight, I am delighted to introduce to you Leon Greck, recipient of the Paul Mellon Frank Brown Pre-Doctoral Rome Prize here at the Academy. Leon is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Comparative Literature and the Interdisciplinary Doctoral Program in the Humanities at Princeton University, where he is specializing on the reception of Roman comedies among professional English dramatists in the late 16th and early 17th centuries, uh, namely Ben Jonson, Shakespeare, and their contemporaries. Prior to studying at Princeton, Leon developed his command of Greek and Latin language and literature, as well as early modern English theater at the University of Oxford, where he wrote his thesis on Ovidian narrative and Roman epistemological discourse in the Fasti. Um, and I saw he already knows one of the organizers of our forthcoming Ovid conference, which will happen at the end of this week, so perhaps you'll have at least one person in attendance. <laughs> no, yeah, I think you'll have scores of people based on the interest I've heard of thus far. In the course of his studies, Leon has earned numerous prestigious awards from an international academic institutions, including fellowships from the Ludwig Maximilians Universität in Munich, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, and perhaps the most prizes and awards any individual has ever received from McGill University, Leon's undergraduate alma mater in Montreal. I won't embarrass Leon any further with the exact number, but it's over a dozen. <laughs> Leon was among the first fellows in this year's group that I had the pleasure to speak with at lunch in those early September days when everybody is here and very eager to hear the question that you're probably somewhat loath to hear now, namely, what are you working on? And his reply hinged on one key word, namely, translation. For someone working at the Academy, a doctoral dissertation about the reception of Roman comedies among early English playwrights, the nature of translation at the heart of the project might seem obvious, the translation of Latin into English. But then again, we're at the academy, where basic terms take on far more significance than meets the eye. True to form, translation for Leon connotes a whole host of relationships across time, culture, and space. There is the original translation by Roman playwrights of what was then considered new comedy from Athens. There is the translation of urban contexts from Athens to Rome, and from several centuries later, from the Rome of antiquity to London of the early modern era. And then there is the translation of ancient Rome as it exists in the early modern English imaginary by way of interactions with contemporary Italian drama, which had to reckon with what Rome had become in the 16th century, a Rome that welcomed performances of ancient drama in brand new piazzas and courtyards, as we've all had the experience uh, to imagine together in our recent walks, for example, to the um, Villa Chigi, no, sorry, Villa Farnesina today, well, then the Villa of Agostino Chigi, uh, along the Via della Lungara or the um, Palazzo of Riario, uh, Cardinal Raphael Riario, that Kathleen uh, so graciously described for us at the Cancelleria there in Campo dei Fiori. And it is with those sites in mind as our contemporary uh, 16th century backdrop this evening that I would like you please to join me in welcoming Leon to the podium, whose talk tonight is titled Staging the City, Comic Translation in Rome and London. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lindsay, for that very kind introduction, and thank you all for, for coming. It's, um, it's a real pleasure to get to, to share my work with all of you, and it's been a real pleasure to get to, to talk about it over um, the past, ye the past uh, six months, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the, next, the rest of the next half of the, the fellowship and of the year. Um, there have been so many great conversations that it seems invidious to single any out, but let's say that I've been um, inspired um, uh, by a number of recent shop talks, other kinds of talks, um, focusing on the Mediterranean as a space of cultural interaction. Um, my talk today is going to wade into those same waters, although in the somewhat amateurish way of a literary scholar. Um, and so you can treat it as, as, a, as a cry for help, or at least a plea for further conversation. Um, uh, and also, I should say, I, it's been uh, a real delight and, and eye-opening to go to um, the Cancelleria and to um, the Farnesina with Kathleen. Um, those sites actually aren't going to end up coming very much into this, into this talk, but they're things I'm thinking a lot about, and so stay tuned for the five-minute talk in, uh, in June. Um, 
One way in which my work doesn't uh, align that much with some of the recent work we've been hearing in shop talks is I don't, in general, focus on individuals as, as the lens through which I, I explore the issues I'm interested in. In part, that's a matter of uh, disposition. I'm, I'm interested more in the, in the texts than in, than in the life stories. And in part, it's a matter of practicality. Most of the people I work on are either, uh, we either know too little about their lives, or in a way we know too much or both at the same time, which is probably the case for certainly for Shakespeare and probably for Plautus and Terence. Um, for my, my fourth main focus, Ben, ben Johnson, who we won't be hearing about tonight. If anyone uh, wants to hear my ideas about a, a hit Ben Johnson biopic, um, we can talk about that over drinks afterwards. I think it would be great. All that being said, I do want to start my talk today with two, um, two anecdotes about individuals to frame the concerns I'm interested in. So, in his life of the poet, uh, in the life of the poet, the second century CE Roman biographer Suetonius describes how, in 160 BCE, the Roman comic playwright Publius Terentius Affer, Publius to his friends, Terence to us Anglophones, set out from Rome on a journey to points east. Only 25 years old, uh, Terence was at this point the controversial golden boy of Roman comedy, with a classic second century BC rags to riches story. Born in Carthage, he'd come as a slave to Rome, where his obvious talents had swiftly won him an education and his freedom. His good looks hadn't hurt either, and these charms, in some combination, had helped him become an intimate friend of two of Rome's most dashing young nobles, Publius Cornelius Scipio Aemilianus and Gaius Lilius. There was gossip about debauched getaways at Scipio's villa in the Alban Hills. At the age of 19, Terence had had his first comedy, The Woman of Andros, performed to great acclaim. Like most Roman comedies, it was an adaptation of a Greek play by the great Athenian comic playwright Menander, and Terence has stirred up some controversy um, by combining scenes and elements drawn from two different Menandrian comedies. Five more hits followed over the next six years. Success had brought rewards. For one comedy, the eunuch, Terence had received a record-breaking 8,000 sesterces as a payment. He owned a suburban retreat just outside the Porta Capena, and just recently, he'd completed a special commission for the funeral games of one of Rome's greatest generals, Lucius Aemilius Paulus, the conqueror of Macedonia, and conveniently, the father of Terence's friend, Scipio Aemilianus. And yet, a few months after this most recent success, Terence apparently, and here I quote from Suetonius, left Rome and never returned. Suetonius' sources seem to have disagreed about his destination. Farthest Greece, said one. Asia, said another, and about the reasons for his departure. He went, Suetonius writes, for his own gratification and to avoid the rumor that he had presented the works of others, i.e. Scipio and Lilius, as his own, or it was to observe the manners and customs of the Greeks so that he might portray them in a new way in his writings. All agreed, however, that the trip had ended with the playwright's untimely death. According to the grammarian Quintus Cosconius, Terence died at sea while returning from Greece, together with 108 plays which he had translated out of Menander. Others said that he had died on land in Arcadia after taking ill or from grief and ennui over his lost luggage and the new plays that he had made. This is all, alas, or much of it, too good to be true. As is often the case with ancient literary biographies, many of its details seem to have been inferred from Terence's plays while others have probably been invented to settle political scores or cover up gaps in the historical record. And Suetonius, it said, is, Suetonius himself, it should be said, um, is, is doubtful of a number of the claims that are made by his sources. And this may well be the case with the romantic tales of Terence's demise. It perhaps no, it's perhaps no coincidence that the island uh, off of which his ship is supposed to have sunk, Lucas, in the Ionian Sea, is the same island off of whose cliffs uh, the Greek poetess Sappho is supposed to have flung herself to her death. What interests me, however, is not so much the historicity of this story, or its lack thereof, as the way in which Suetonius' account of Terence's final journey and the journey itself map out the cultural geography and cultural history of Roman comedy. Terence's trip uh, east takes him from a Rome that, despite being the largest city in the Western Mediterranean and the dominant imperial power across the entire Mediterranean, remained in important ways on the margins of the Greek cultural ecumene. And it takes him from there to mainland Greece, what, what Plautus would call Germana Graecia, real Greece, pure Greece, 
Um, and we should surely imagine to Athens, the cultural lodestar, if no longer in practical terms, the cultural center of the Hellenistic world. Uh, and, in re uh, and on whose dramatic canon, the Athenian dramatic canon, uh, Roman playwrights were quite deliberately modeling their own creation of a Latin drama. And in real life, and this is, this is a map from, uh, from Orbis, the, um, the ancient world mapping, the mapping project at Stanford. Um, in real life, Terence, to get to Athens, would surely have gone down the Via Appia uh, to Tarentum, uh, the most important Greek city in, in southern Italy, um, and also the hometown of Livius Andronicus, an earlier migrant to Rome, who had essentially invented Latin literature by translating a Greek play into Latin in 240 BC. And so the trip kind of repeats the history of the last 80 years of Roman literature and Roman drama. Suetonius' description of Terence's reason for going on this trip to observe the customs and manners of the Greeks vividly embodies the cultural dynamics of Terence's comic genre, the fabula palliata, or Greek dress comedy, with its, Athenian set, with its Athenian settings and its keen interest in the social and cultural differences between Greece and Rome. And his account of the playwright's ill-fated return journey uh, neatly associates Terence's translation of Menander's plays from Greek into Latin, that suitcase full of plays that he's bringing home, uh, with the large-scale translatio, or literally carrying across, uh, of cultural artifacts from Greece to Rome that had followed the victorious wars of the previous half century. And not least among the artifacts that had come to Rome was the Macedonian Royal Library, which had been brought to the city in 168 as a personal plunder of the Aemilianus brothers. So, um, so Terence was right there. At the same time, the story reminds us of the inevitable perils of this kind of cultural appropriation. In the final telling, both playwright and plays are quite literally lost in translation. More than 1,700 years later, at the other end of Europe, another young man of the theater set out, as he himself put it, to furrow his wild oats in a foreign ground. <laughs> in the autumn of 1578, Londoner Anthony Munday was 18 years old, a former printer's apprentice, and a would-be man of letters. Munday would, in fact, go on to have a long and fantastically varied literary career, including as a comic playwright of some, and now somewhat inexplicable, renown. <laughs> Already in 1577 to 78, he had published Galleon of France, a translation of the medieval French romance, Galleon Restauré, but this had made no discernible impression, and in fact, no copies survive. And so, as he explains in the first chapter of The English Roman Life, his published account of his adventures that year, when as desire to see strange countries, as also affection to learn the languages, had persuaded me to leave my native country, I committed the small wealth I had into my purse, a traveler's weed on my back, the whole state and condition of my journey to God's appointment, and being accompanied with one Thomas Noel, crossed the seas from England to Boulogne, France. From Boulogne, Monday and Noel made their way gradually and somewhat fortuitously to Rome, arriving on Candlemas Eve, February 1st, 1579. Armed with letters of recommendation from the English Catholic exiles with whom they'd met in Paris, um, they obtained admission to the English College. Here. The, uh, the seminary for English priests that Pope Gregory XIII had recently established on the site of a medieval pilgrim ho uh, pilgrim's hospice for English pilgrims, the English hospital. As a three-month borsista at the college, Monday visited the seven pilgrim churches, explored the catacombs of San Pancrazio and Santa Priscilla, ate very well in the college's refectory, helped instigate a revolt by the college's English students against their Welsh rector, <laughs> and met the Pope, who had to, had to calm down this, this dispute, um, which led to the college being given to the, being given to the Jesuits. Um, most interestingly for our purposes, he may also have acquainted himself with the city's theatrical scene, and particularly with the improvised Commedia dell'arte. Upon his return to England, according to an anonymous pamphlet published in 1582, this scholar, new come out of Italy, did play extempore. And those gentlemen and others which were present can guess, best give witness of his dexterity, who, being weary of his folly, hissed him from the stage. <laughs> there are, to be sure, reasons to be cautious about this report. There was widespread anxiety in Anglican England about young English Catholics traveling abroad 
becoming radicalized and returning home with plans to assassinate Queen Elizabeth, to overthrow her government, and to return the country to the embrace of Rome. Monday, who had managed to spend his entire time abroad in the company of English Catholic exiles, would have been an immediate object of suspicion on his return home. His situation would have become even more precarious with the well-publicized arrival of a, an illegal Jesuit mission to England in June of 1580 led by Edmund Campion and including a number of priests whom Monday had met uh, in Rome. After Campion's capture in July 1581, and for that period, that year of 1581, everyone knows Monday is in the country, and, and he's sort of going from uh, hospitable aristocratic Catholic household to household, while the government is sort of chasing him. There's this manhunt on. Um, so after his capture in 1581, Monday, out of fear, genuine zeal, or perhaps most likely canny business sense, became an anti-Catholic polemicist and informer. <laughs> he testified against Campion at his trial, although he had no evidence other than the insults that he had heard thrown at the Queen while in Rome, um, and then published his testimony in a pamphlet, in, a, in pamphlet form. And it's in an anonymous Catholic response to Monday's pamphlet, not exactly an unbiased source, that is, that we find this account of Monday's uh, dabblings with the Commedia dell'arte. But here again, the historicity of the story is somewhat beside the point. Like Terence's grand tour of Greece, Monday's Roman holiday had taken the young author from a city that, although in the midst of a truly unprecedented urban expansion, remained very much on England's cultural periphery, and had taken him from there to an iconic center of ancient and early modern European culture. In turn, Monday's desire to attain to some understanding in the languages, as he puts it, and his attempted transplantation of improvised comedy out of Italy to England embody the ongoing efforts by English writers to foster an English Renaissance culture through the wholesale translation of continental texts and literary forms into English. Prominent among these was Italian neoclassical drama. In 1573, George Gascoigne had published Supposes, his influential uh, translation of Ariosto's comedy Sopositi, which itself was based on two Roman comedies, and Gascoigne's Supposes, which um, no one really reads now outside of English departments, probably has a claim to be the most influential English comedy of the 16th century. Um, in 1576, James Burbage had opened the theater, the first of the permanent playhouses that would, by the end of the century, underpin London's distinctive claim to be a cultural heir to Roman Athens. And by 1582, the anti-theatrical polemicist Stephen Gosson could complain that body comedies in Latin, French, Italian, and Spanish have been thoroughly ransacked to furnish the playhouses in London. Monday himself would contribute to this repertoire with his translation somewhere around 1583, um, his play, Fidele and Fortunio, uh, an adaptation of a decidedly body and sort of totally Baroque um, Italian comedy, Luigi Pasquali, Pasqualio's 1576, Il Fidele. So taken together, these two stories about travel and translation map out the terrain of the dissertation that I'm working on and hopefully finishing during my time at the Academy. The project looks at the reception of Roman comedy in late 16th and early 17th century England, specifically as translated literature, which is I'm really interested in the way in which English playwrights map their activities onto the, the translation history of Roman comedy in the way that I've just done um, in, in, in that opening. Um, and I'm interested in the way in which uh, the Roman comic translation uh, becomes a model then for English engagements, both with Roman comedy itself and with vernacular comedy. And I, what I'm trying to argue is that comic translation is doing importantly similar work in both Rome and London in terms of situating these cities in relation to their broader, essentially Mediterranean cultural worlds. And that by thinking about them together, uh, we can get insight, new and useful insights both into English comedy and into, and into Roman comedy. Um, and so the dissertation has, in a, has a series of thematic chapters, um, each of which looks at texts from across the chronological span I'm interested in, um, and looks at a different aspect of, of translation. And as Lindsay said in her introduction, I, I'm not, I, I take translation quite broadly. Um, Roman comedies themselves are, uh, 
are adaptations in many ways of Greek comedy rather than what we would think of as a translation. Um, and I also consider under my rubric of translation a lot of things, a lot of Renaissance comedies that aren't really translations at all, but that are involved in the transfer of this form, the transfer of its, um, its institutions, its, uh, its plots, its character types from antiquity to the Renaissance and then around Renaissance Europe. Um, at the same time, the metaphors I've been playing with today uh, in this opening set the stage for the work I want to present today. I want to look particularly in the shop talk at the way in which comic playwrights themselves use stories like, like these ones, like the stories of, of Terence and Monday, fictions of travel, of shipwreck, uh, of education, to think through the cultural geographies of their theatrical enterprise. And specifically to think through, the, to, to, to read in, to map in Rome and London into these networks of Mediterranean cultural exchange. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, sort of introduce why I think that's a, a plausible claim to make. Um, I'm going to look at how that plays out in, in one, com one Roman comedy and one English adaptation of that Roman comedy. And so over the, the remainder of the talk, I'm going to move from, from a kind of general background, which will hopefully situate the project as a whole in addition to this work, towards what will hopefully be um, uh, sprightly and engaging as opposed to tedious and laborious close readings at the end. Um, and I should say also this is, very, this is very new work. I wanted to use the shop talk both to, to give a sense of what I'm working on, but also as a spur to, to um, start moving it in a, in a different direction. And so um, I really welcome uh, comments, um, corrections, all kinds of suggestions. Things are in a very protean phase here. But now that we're all warmed up, though, let me, in the tradition of the best Roman comic prologues, start again and go back to the beginning. <laughs> I think I need water for this. Salutem primum yam a principio propitiam miatque vobis spectatores nuntio. Aporto vobis plautum lingua non manu, quae sut benignis accipiatis auribus. That well being, first of all, is now from the beginning well disposed to me and you, spectators. That's what I'm announcing. I bring you Plautus on my tongue, not on my hands. Please receive him with your kindly ears. So the particular piece of Plautus that I'm bringing you are the opening lines to the prologue to his comedy, Menaikmi, first performed sometime around 200 BCE. Plautus, who died around the time Terence is born, is the other great playwright of Republican Rome. Um, his 20 surviving plays, just part of a much larger body of work, um, together with Terence's six comedies, constitute our entire corpus of fully extant Roman drama. Menaikmi is almost certainly a translation of a Greek new comedy, a variety of Athenian comedy that developed in the second half of the fourth century BC. Brand new new comedies were still being written in Plautus's day, but Roman playwrights tended to restrict themselves um, to the canonical first generation of new comic playwrights. Above all, Menander, whose career stretches from 321 to 291 BC, and his contemporaries Diphilus and Philemon. As is often the case, though, we don't actually know the title of Menaikami's Greek model or its author. Uh, one of the major complications to the study of Roman comedy is that despite the, the fact that these Greek plays, and particularly Menander, were colossally popular uh, all through antiquity, they virtually entirely disappeared between the end of antiquity and, and the Renaissance. Uh, and so it's only in the last hundred years or so that we've been able to read substantial, if still very mutilated, pieces of Menander thanks to papyrological discoveries in Egypt. The plot of the Menaikmi, as it happens, deviates from the basic pattern, uh, the basic pattern uh, of new comedy. In comparison with the better known old comedy of Aristophanes, so that's fifth century comedy, which featured fantastically absurd plots, uh, lots of obscenity, and often viciously political satire, Tim, uh, new comedy is a bit like the Tim Hortons of the genre. It's prized for its realistic representation of the quotidian domestic concerns of the Athenian bourgeoisie, and it's often, truth be told, a little insipid. Boiled down to its essentials, as Kathleen McCarthy memorably puts it, 
New comedy is about the business of getting and begetting, about economics and reproduction. And so the most familiar plot features a young man who's got himself involved in some kind of sexual entanglement with an inappropriate young woman. And with the help of his, uh, his clever slave, he needs to wangle financial resources or permission to marry out of his father, who objects to this match on a number of more or less uh, reasonable, um, reasonable grounds. Uh, we side with the young man, so the grounds are less reasonable. But sometimes they are just not wanting to have the, the family treasure go to, go to pay for high-class prostitutes. Um, so we have generational conflict and love interest. But we don't have any of those things in, in Manaikmi. Rather, as the prologue goes on to tell us, the play concerns two identical twin brothers. Uh, is lost as a child when he's taken by his father to a fair in another city. He's kidnapped by a merchant from yet a third city. Uh, the father dies of grief at the fair, and the twin who's left at home is, in a supremely confusing twist, renamed to have the same name as his other brother by the grandfather left at home. So there are now two Manaikmases, the two Manaikmi, the title, running around. And on the day that our play takes place, uh, the, the Manaikmi, the, the, the Manaikmas who didn't get stolen, ends up who spent years looking for the Manaikmas who did get stolen, ends up arriving, unbeknownst to him, in the town where his brother is an established citizen with all the trappings of bourgeois respectability, a, a nagging wife, uh, a greedy mistress, uh, and a sponging parasite who's a sort of specialty uh, social role in the, in the Hellenistic Mediterranean, someone who, who you know, tells you jokes and you give them food uh, or not. Um, so... So the two Manaikmi are here in the same town. They don't know it, and, and predictable hilarity ensues. So this is starting to sound uh, very familiar. Um, it probably should. Mediated through its Roman translations, new comedy would go on to become the basis for the major traditions of post-classical uh, European comic drama. Uh, so uh, Plautus and Terence are among the few authors who are read eagerly, continuously through the medieval period. Terence more than Plautus, but, but both are in play. And starting in the late 15th century, um, they begin to be performed again uh, by Italian humanists, including um, Pomponio Leto and his Roman Academy, in productions put on by people like Raffaella Riario. Um, starting in the 16th century, Italian playwrights start writing imitations and adaptations of Roman comedy in the vernacular, um, and from there, it spreads, across, it spreads across Europe. Um, Manaikmi very rapidly becomes a favorite. The first known performance of Roman comedy after the end of antiquity, it's a performance in Italian of Manaikmi uh, at the court of the Deste Dukes of Ferrara in 1486. Um, and over the course of the 16th century, Manaikmises and their descendants proliferate all across Europe. Um, the most familiar descendant of, of, of the type, and the one that we'll be interested in a little bit later, is Shakespeare's Comedy of Errors, which, which is where most Anglophone audiences will have their familiarity with this basic plot type. What interests me right now, however, um, oh, well, let me, so this is, a, this is just a map of, of places where in the 16th century either um, translations or close adaptations of Manaikmi are published. So there's a, a whole slew in northern Italy. Um, there's uh, three German translations, Spanish translations in, or adaptations of Valencia and Antwerp. And in England, Shakespeare's Comedy of Errors in 1494. Uh, Manaikmi's first play translated straightforwardly in English, sorry, 1594. Translated in 1595. It comes to France a bit late with Rotru in 1636. So as I was saying, what interests me right now are some of the other ways in which Manaikmi typifies some of the features of new comedy. So the prominence of travel and migration in the background to the plot, the going to the fair, the going looking for your brother all around the Mediterranean. Um, that's entirely typical of the genre. Uh, characters in these plays are often away from home or displaced in some way, whether voluntarily, in the case of merchants and mercenaries, <coughs> against their will, political exiles, abandoned and kidnapped children, obviously slaves, or somewhere in between. The Athens of Menander's comedy is full of courtesans, uh, hetairai, from Aegean Island who have been driven into the city and into prostitution by, by economic necessity. Um, this is a, an illustration from, from the Gruninger edition of, of Terence, a late, um, late 15th century uh, 
addition, and it, it maps out um, these kind of displacements. So, I mean, it, it gets very complicated. This is Andrea, Terence's first play, and you can see at the top, that's, um, uh, that's Pamphila, the, the, sorry, that's um, Glicarium, the love interest, uh, on that raft at the top, and she's gotten lost, she's been shipwrecked on, she's going to be adopted on Andros, even though she's an Athenian citizen, she ends up back in Athens, not, know, not knowing her parents are, people think she's a courtesan, and the rest of the, the hijinks on this, on this map ensue. Characteristic two is the, the geography against which all this movement takes place. Fifth century Athenian comedy is decidedly inward looking. Aristophanes' plays are set either in Athens or in its surrounding countryside or in other worldly locations. The underworld, Mount Olympus, the bird city of cloud cuckoo land. Fourth and third century comedy has broader terrestrial horizons. Manikmi is very typical of the genre in this way. Uh, so the Manikmi brothers are from Syracuse, down here. The fair where one of them gets lost is here in Tarentum. He's kidnapped in Tarentum by, a, or Taras in Greek, by a, a merchant from Epidamnus, which is over here. Um, and that's where the action of the play takes place, in Epidamnus. Um, and in fact, the, the play takes place even in, even, is set within an even wider uh, Western Mediterranean geography. So um, we hear that the, the Menachemus from Syracuse has gone looking for his brother. He spent six years sailing around doing so. He's gone to Spain. Uh, he's gone to Istria. He's gone to Massilia here at Marseille. He's gone all around the Adriatic, including the, the coast here. He's gone to Graecia Exotica, which is uh, southern the Greek settlements in, in southern Italy, more normally known as, as Magna Graecia. Um, and he's gone to every harbor in Italy that the sea has touched. So he's, there's a, a lot of ground being covered. Um, Menachemi is, I, I said it was typical, it's not, this kind of travel isn't the case in the majority, say, of, of, of new comic plays. Most plays are probably still set in Athens, as far as we can tell from, the, um, from, their, from their titles and from the fragments we have. But it's by no means an exception. Uh, so if we brought in our map again, um, we know that plays were set um, in, uh, in Epidaurus, in Scythion and Corinth, so there's, these are in central Greece, this is Athens here, in Caledon and other cities in Aetolia here, in Lucas, this island here, uh, in Ephesus in Asia Minor, in Cyrene in North Africa, um, and that's probably only a partial list. There, probably, there, there's reasons to think plays were set in, um, in Tarentum and elsewhere in southern Italy, on the Black Sea coast. Um, and even comedies that are set in Athens uh, reflect this new international perspective. In Aristophanes' comedies, non-Athenian foreigners uh, regularly come in for chauvinistic mockery. And new comic playwrights, um, while not above that kind of thing, do offer sympathetic portrayals of characters from across the Greek world or even from outside of it. Alexis and Menander both uh, write plays featuring reasonably sympathetic uh, Carthaginian characters. So to some degree, this broader outlook may simply reflect social conditions in fourth century Athens. Internal political upheavals in the second half of the century did in fact drive many Athenian citizens into voluntary or involuntary exile elsewhere in the Greek world, while the incessant wars between the successors of Alexander the Great created new opportunities for mercenary service abroad. And conversely, upheaval elsewhere brought citizens of other states to Athens. Throughout the century, resident foreigners and medics played an increasingly important role in the life of the polis. But new comedy's representational mobility, its new representational mobility, also reflects the fact that comedy itself was on the move. Greek comedy had long been an international affair. Fifth century Sicily had a robust and sophisticated comic tradition that may predate Athens and may have influenced its development, the development of Athenian comedy. Um, Aristophanes' comedies seem to have been known and possibly performed um, in southern Italy already in the very early fourth century. Um, but the fourth century witnessed a remarkable transformation of Athenian comedy and Athenian drama more generally into an export commodity. Um, as monumental theaters sprung up across the Greek world, 
not least um, in Sicily and southern Italy. Uh, and as traveling troops of actors emerged to, to play in them, Athenian comic playwrights dramatically ramped up their production. Over a 40-year career, Aristophanes has written 44 plays, which is the, probably the most that we know of, of, um, of any 5th century playwright. Menander, in contrast, whose career is only 30 years long, is supposed to have written between 105 and 109 plays. There are similar numbers for Diphilus and Philemon, and their older contemporary Alexis is credited with 245 plays, although he's also credited with like an 80-year productive career, um, which people seem oddly willing to accept as a, as a claim. Um, given the limited number of plays that could be performed at the Athenian Dramatic Festival, which hadn't gone up since the 5th century, um, many of these plays must have been written for festivals outside of Athens, and plays that performed at Athens would also have traveled around the Greek world. So this internationalization of, uh, of Greek comedy is often sort of presented as uh, the cause of the unfortunate depoliticization and reduction in topicality in new comedy as opposed to old comedy. You know, the, the, these foreign audiences wouldn't be able to take all the, all the great political Athen Athenian, jokes about Athenian politics and politicians, and so it sort of gets flattened out. Um, that's been challenged in recent work, but that recent work has still attempted to uh, redeem, um, in a way, new comedy by saying that it really is, in fact, just as vigorously about politics just by, just by other means. But we might also look at this development, this internationalization, I think, or present it in more positive terms as representing the, um, the development of a more um, sort of cosmopolitan set, an international set of comic concerns that represents an aesthetic and a politics in its, in its own rights. Um, playwrights would surely have been writing, that is to say, with these, these audiences in mind, not just of what they couldn't take, but what they might, in fact, be actively interested in. So it's perhaps no coincidence that Menachemy's backstory, and presumably the backstory of its Greek original, links together Syracuse and Tarentum, the two leading theatrical centers of the Western Mediterranean. Comic plots in which travel and displacement linked Athens to other cities around, uh, around the Mediterranean could have appealed both to Athenian audiences and to Western Greeks, uh, who increasingly looked to Athens as a cultural model. And so those plots, in a sense, would have mapped out the, the again, the kind of cultural roots that comedy itself was, was taking and that uh, audiences were interested in. And in many such cases, such plots of displacement would also recall the backgrounds of their playwrights, increasing number of whom were foreign migrants to Athens, uh, who'd come in hopes of making it big in the big city. Alexis was from Thurii in present-day Basilicata, Diphilus and his brother Diodorus came from Sinope on the northern coast of Asia Minor. And Philemon, like the Menachemy boys, hailed from Syracuse. An even greater dislocation of Athenian comedy came, of course, with its appropriation and translation into Latin in late 3rd century BCE Rome. And in many ways, that, that adoption of, of um, Greek comedy into Latin represents an extension of these earlier processes of internationalization. So not only does Livius Andronicus, the first playwright, come from Tarentum, the great theatrical center of southern Italy, um, but it's been suggested um, that the first actors who played these Latin plays may have also been drawn from traveling Greek troops, and the Greek troops probably were an important source of supply for the scripts that Roman dramatists were translating, um, certainly in the third and probably into the second century. Here, of course, there are reasons that, that it's harder um, to connect these real-world movements of comic texts and personnel with the fictional geographies within the plays. Fourth and third century Athenian playwrights were obviously not writing with Roman audiences in mind. And indeed, unlike, unlike Carthage, Rome's great rival, Roman Romans are nowhere to be found at all in the extant, in the extant fragments of, of Greek comedy. We don't, it, would be it would be great if we had more of um, second century BC and first century BC Greek comedy, which we, which we, which we don't, um, to see how Rome gets represented from that side. Um, and Roman playwrights seem, distant, seem to have been disinclined to alter the plots of their models as opposed to their incidental details in order to reflect the political and cultural landscapes of their own time as opposed to the late 4th, early 3rd century in which their scripts are coming from. It does seem notable that more than a third of Plautus's plays are set in non-Athenian locations, whereas none of Terence's are. Um, and that jives with our sense that Plautus is more interested in uh, the kind of tensions and difference between Rome and Athens and Rome and Greeks than Terence, who's an 
atticizer and a, and a Hellenizer and is more interested in a kind of attic classicism. But the sample sizes we're dealing with are very small. The sample sizes we're dealing with for the other Roman comic playwrights are basically non-existent. We have titles that are very difficult to tell where a play is set. Um, and so it's difficult to make conclusions from that. But still, it's easy to see the appeal of a comic geography like that of Menachemy to Plautus and to a Roman audience. Not only would the play's Western Mediterranean setting have been appealingly familiar to Roman theater goers around 200 BCE, but each of its principal on and offstage locations represented an important inflection point in Rome's political and cultural relationship with the Hellenistic world. The fall of Tarentum in 272 BCE had concluded Rome's conquest of Greek South Italy. Um, and as we've seen, the, this was also, the city was later the home, uh, furnished Rome with Livius Andronicus. Andronicus' first play was commissioned for the Ludi Romani of 240 BCE, which has celebrated Rome's victory over Carthage. Um, and that war had been largely fought in Sicily, with Syracuse as an important ally. As Dennis Feeney has recently argued, the generation-long presence of Roman legionaries and naval personnel in the Greek culture of, of Syracuse would have been an important spur, presumably, to Livius' commission. Um, and e even before the war, Roman elites had looked to Syracuse as a cultural model. And more recently, in 212 BC, Syracuse, which had unwisely sided with Hannibal in the Second Punic War, had been sacked by the army of Marcus Claudius Marcellus. And the spoils of that sack, which included much of the city's artistic patrimony, um, constituted the, the first major transfer of Greek art into Rome. Finally, Epidamnus, situated across from the Roman colony of Brindisium on the southern Adriatic, was a vital port of entry um, for Italian merchants and Roman armies into mainland Greece, um, to which, again, Rome was increasingly turning her cultural attention. So simply by being performed in Rome, rather than in Syracuse or in Athens, a fictional geography that we can imagine was intended to appeal, or potentially intended to appeal to Western Greeks, is thus transformed into a map of Rome's Hellenizing project, of which, of course, Menachemy is itself a part. We can also point to a number of places in which Plautus seems to have altered or added to his Greek original to play up the bicultural resonances of Menachemy's translated Mediterranean. There are, for example, his repeated puns on the presence inside the Greek place name Epidamnus of the Latin word for financial loss, damnum. Upon arriving in town, Messenio, the slave of Syracuse and Menachemus, warns his master that this city is called Epidamnus because practically nobody puts up here without being damnified. That's the quote from Wolfgang de Mello's recent Loeb translation. The pun works better in Latin um, where the the verbal, the, it's damno and, and damno at the end. This is a typical, a very typical piece of Plautine wordplay. It calls attention to the play's translatedness by puncturing its Greek illusion, right? Only a Latin-speaking stage Greek can make this kind of pun. It doesn't, doesn't work in Greek. Um, but in this case, it also evokes Epidamnus' real-life history as a site for commercial and inevitably linguistic interchange between Greece and Italy. As several later sources tell us, Roman travelers really did consider Epidamnus a word of ill omen. And in Plautus' day, the city was already better known as Dyrrachium, uh, even by its Greek-speaking inhabitants. Plautus, in fact, is completely upfront about what he's doing here. No sooner has he secured our kindly ears than the prologue tells us there's something very special about this play. Oh, and poets do this thing in comedies. They claim that everything happened in Athens so that it'll seem more Greek to you. I'll say what happened nowhere except where it's said to have happened. And also, this plot summary parlays Greek. Yet it doesn't parlay Attic, but parlays Siciliatique. I'm sorry for those deform, deformed words. I'm try, I, there's, there's a sort of um, this Greek Latin punning going on, which Fre one sort of turns to French to do in English, which doesn't, for all sorts of reasons, doesn't work properly, but it's sometimes hard to figure out a better alternative. So these lines set up a complex set of correspondences between the distinctive setting of Plautus' Greek original and the further linguistic displacement of his own play. Only a Latin prologue, after all, would need to inform his audience that he was speaking Greek. And only a Plautine prologue could get away with using the mongrel verb graikisat, graikisare, which is formed by attaching an ostentatiously Greekizing verbal suffix, isare, which is supposed to be the, the Greek Isdain, uh, 
to the entirely normal Latin word for Greek, Graecus, which is not, in fact, the word that the Greeks at this period called themselves. Um, we, might per, we might compare the, the, the kind of sh rapid shifting of cultural perspective that's going on here um, to Plautus's claim in other prologues to have taken a Greek play and turned it barbarian because it's no longer Greek speaking. But it's also tempting to hear um, in Plautus's uh, claim that he's going to, that this, this argument is going to speak Greek, not Attic, but Sicilian, to hear there an echo also of Greek new comedies, distinctive um, geographical poetics. Uh, the, the kind of run-on syntax of this sentence, so that it, it speaks Greek, but not Attic, but Sicilian, um, allows us to initially hear an opposition not between Attic and Sicilian, but between Greek and Attic. Um, and this, in fact, is, a, is the distinction that would have been familiar to Plautus's unknown, the author of Plautus' unknown Greek original. And it reflects a, a kind of argument or a, a taking of cultural sides between a view that sees Attic usage and more broadly Attic culture as defining and distinctive for Greece and a more, uh, uh, a more cosmopolitan or more ecumenical, more international view of Greek culture that sees the Greeks all as Greeks, even if they're all Greeks who are looking to Athens to define cultural excellence. Um, and in fact, in a fragment of, uh, that comes from the early third century um, BC playwright Posidippus, who himself was born in Macedonia, one character says to another, probably in response to his frenemy's criticism of his Greek usage, there is one Greece and many cities. You speak Attic whenever you say a word of your own, but we Greeks speak Greek. So that's Attikisdain and Hellenisdain, which is the Greek's version of, of Graecosare. Without the context, it's impossible to know how we're supposed to take this repost. How bad was the original mistake? Are both speakers Athenians, or is one of them not an Athenian? Um, but it still, in some ways, captures, I think, or can sort of we can link it to the, the cosmopolitanism or the internationalism of, Greek com of, of fourth century and third century Greek comedy. Posidippus' opposition is not, of course, the same as Plautus's. Um, and as the Umbrian-born Roman playwright has his prologue add uh, that he speaks not Attic, but Sicilian, he's ushering in a no less momentous expansion of new comedy's cultural horizons. He's reminding his listeners that Greek is now going to be defined in relation to its Latin periphery. As he does so, he's making a place for his Rome between Syracuse and Athens in the heart of the comic Mediterranean. One last story, at least for now, of comic displacement. In Syracuse, I was born and wed unto a woman, happy but for me. And by me had not our hap been bad. With her I lived in joy, our wealth increased. With prosperous voyages I often made to Epidamnum till my factor's death. So begins the story of Aegean, the father of the twin Antipholuses in Shakespeare's 1594 adaptation of Menaikmi, the Comedy of Errors. In his tale, which takes the place of Plautus' prologue, Aegean explains how, 25 years earlier, he'd lost his, infant wife, his, he lost his wife and one of his infant sons, and one of the other pair of twin infants who they'd bought as slaves to go along with their infant twins, um, in a shipwreck. How 18 years after that, his remaining son had left Syracuse to look for his mother and brother, uh, along with the other identical twin slave. How five years ago from when he's speaking now, Aegean himself is set off to look for his family, bringing him to eventually to Ephesus, Ephesus, where just moments before in the opening lines of the play, we've seen him be sentenced to death by the Duke as part of a trade war between Syracuse and Ephesus. The same Duke is the attentive audience for Aegean's story. Nay, forward, old man, do not break off so, he helpfully encourages him when the old merchant risks being overcome by emotion. For we may pity, though not pardon thee, Shakespeare's substitution of this sad story from Menaikmi's wisecrossing prologue is typically seen as heralding his transformation of his Plautine model into a generic hybrid of comedy and romance. In particular, Aegean's story of loss and wandering is often thought to derive from the history of Apollonius of Tyre, a 5th or 6th century Latin prose narrative with a very rich medieval and Renaissance afterlife. The tale, which Shakespeare adapted more fully in his late, Rome, uh, in his late romance Pericles, defies easy summary. 
but here goes. Apollonius, the prince of Tyre, discovers that Antiochus, the king of Syria, is having an incestuous affair with his daughter. He is pursued across the eastern Mediterranean by Antiochus and is eventually shipwrecked in Cyrene, where he manages to marry the local princess. She later dies aboard ship, or so it seems, giving birth to a daughter, whom Apollonius then entrusts to his friends, the rulers of Tarsus, who later arranged to have her killed, telling Apollonius that she had died of natural causes, while, unbeknownst to everybody, she had actually been kidnapped by pirates and sold into prostitution. Years later, Apollonius is reunited with his daughter and finally with his wife, now a priestess in the Temple of Diana at Ephesus. And so the Comedy of Errors, the, I mean, the comedy of errors does in fact end with a similar kind of family reunion um, with its two sets of male twins replacing Apollonius' only daughter. But if the travels and displacements of Aegean and his family bear some relationship at least to those of Apollonius, they're also firmly rooted, or it might be better to say loosely rooted, in the more mundane displacements of the new comic Mediterranean. Aegean, the merchant, uh, the merchant of Syracusa, uh, is a rather bourgeois romantic hero. His travails, up to and including his rest in Ephesus, are those of a comic merchant, not a Hellenistic prince. Indeed, Aegean's story is effectively the story told by the Menachemi Prologue, which similarly begins with the twin's father, a Syracusan merchant. Um, tellingly, the beginning and the end of Aegean's travels are both drawn quite directly from Menachemi's backstory. Um, his account of prosperous voyages to Epidamnum not only alludes to the Ionian setting of Plautus' comedy, but also plays ominously on Plautus' puns about the town's associations with commercial losses. Um, this, is by, by the way, is somewhat out of order, but this is, this is a map that Shakespeare might have known of the Eastern Mediterranean. It's in the Geneva Bible. Uh, and then we have his final, uh, Menachemus' final description uh, of how he gets to Ephesus in the end. <laughs> Five summers have I spent in farthest Greece, roaming clean through the bounds of Asia, and coasting homewards came to Ephesus. And this pointedly recalls, and in part translates, Messenio's account of his and Menachemus of Syracuse's six years of travels to destinations that include Drychiam Exoticam, which is glossed by Plautus' great 16th century commentator, Denis Lambin, Dionysius Lambinus, as Drychia Longinqua, far off Greece, Greece, farthest Greece. As he describes his, his and his family's wanderings in this Plautine Mediterranean, Aegean is also, like a good Plautine prologue, mapping out the literary relationship between the comedy of errors and Menachemi. The long arc of Aegean's journey from Epidamnum to Ephesus calls attention to and enacts Shakespeare's own displacement of Plautus' play from Epidamnum to Ephesus, where he sets it. Similarly, Shakespeare's reference to farthest Greece turns the second to last stop on, the, on Messenio's tour of the Western Mediterranean into Aegean's first port of call on his and the play's journey east. In this last example in particular, Shakespeare is also displaying a keen awareness of the cultural and literary complexities of Menachemi's translated geography. Referring to the Greek cities of southern Italy, Drychiam exoticum is the most culturally volatile term in Messenio's entire gazetteer of the increasingly Roman Western Mediterranean. Combining the Latin name, proper name Drychia again with an obvious Greek loanword, exotike, the phrase simultaneously reflects the different but inevitably overlapping cultural geographies of Hellenistic Greeks, for whom southern Italy is, the, is at an edge of the Greek world, and Republican Romans, who could still pretend at least that Greeks in Italy and beyond were très exotique. Shakespeare would have gotten some sense of the term's complexities from Lombinus's gloss. Lombinus both says it's far away and identifies it with, with Italy and Magna Graecia. And his translation of the term similarly combines literal fidelity with total transformation in a way that anticipates the comedy of errors' generic, own generic transformation. Aegean's farthest Greece is both a real place in the Plautine Mediterranean and the jumping off point for a romance adventure clean through the bounds of Asia. In Menachemi, as we've seen, Plautus' linking together of his comedy's fictions of displacement in the Western Mediterranean and his own project of translation can be understood as part of a larger effort to think through Rome's place on the cultural map of the Hellenistic oikumene. Could we see Shakespeare's remapping of the comedy of errors as doing something similar for far off gloomy London? Other English playwrights certainly tried to use Plautus in this way. In his 1624 adaptation of Rudens, another play about displacement and belonging on the edges of the Greek world, 
Shakespeare's younger contemporary, Thomas Haywood, moved the action of the play from Greek Cyrene to the, on the coast of Libya to 16th century Marseille and transformed the displaced Athenians at the center of Plautus' comedy into English innocence abroad. There are moments in comedy areas where Shakespeare does something like this. Dromeo, the, uh, the Dromeo from Syracuse, worry, thinks that he might turn sorcerer in Ephesus when things are looking pretty good, which is a kind of reference to the turning Turk of Rob's converting sea from a couple of weeks ago. But by and large, although his Ephesus resembles Elizabethan London in many ways, the comedy of errors remains securely in the distant east and somewhat less securely in the distant past. And it's worth noting that this is a kind of radical choice. Very few Renaissance playwrights in the 16th century maintain ancient settings for their adaptations of Roman comedies. Ariosto does it for his first Commedia Erudita, which kind of founds the genre in 1508. And then he moves to Ferrara for his second one in 1509, Sopositi, which is, is, is sort of the more famous. And that becomes, that sets the template for 16th century Italian comedy and really comedy across, across Europe. But this radical choice perhaps points to the way, a way in which the comedy of errors does draw England into this Mediterranean world. Uh, Shakespeare's play represents a radical attempt to introduce classicizing comedy in all of its ancient garb onto a popular stage, while at the same time, because this is, perform this is written not for the, the noble houses of Italy, the sort of ducal palaces, but performed for popular audiences in London in the commercial theater. Well, at the same time, taking that, play that theater's interest in these stories of romance and accommodating them within this structure, this, this different Mediterranean, this Plautine Mediterranean of trade, of communication, of translation. And so in this way, Shakespeare, Aegean's reference to farthest Greece, which holds in suspense a Plautine world and a romance world, um, represents no less than, than Plautus's reconfiguration of Atticizing and Greeceizing and Sicilicizing, um, an attempt to reduce the cultural difference between England and Athens. Um, that distance, that distance the, the claim that England would have through its theater to be an uh, inheritor of Greece and Rome would not ultimately be achieved through plays like the Comedy of Errors. This is a kind of one-off experiment in many ways. But still, by 1594, the experiment and the project is well underway. Thank you. Let me start, thank you. Um, I mean, in lots of, I mean, the, to, start with the, to start at the end with the translatio imperii, I mean, that, um, that rhetoric does show up in relation to, um, to, this, kind, to, this, to this material. So in, in Thomas Haywood's apology for, uh, not in his apology, sorry, in Thomas Haywood's 
dedicatory poem to the opening of the new um, Cockpit and Court Theater in 1630, which is Inigo Jones' new theater at, the, at Whitehall Palace, and it's the first, I mean, England is late to these things. It's the, it's the kind of closest England comes to something like the Teatro Olimpico in, in Vicenza, um, and it's not that close, but it's a kind of classicizing neoclassical theater. And, um, and Haywood has this, this, this poem addressed to the king, which he specifically sort of traces a, a, a translatio uh, Teatri at Imperi from Greece to Rome to England of, of looking at the ruined theaters of Greece and Rome, which now there's this new theater rising in England. Um, uh, so that so that's one answer. The other answer, what interests me about this um, this trajectory is that in some ways it can um, uh, it sort of provides another um, narrative of that translation in the sense that um, comedy is, by definition, the thing that doesn't deal with empire, this kind of comedy. I mean, it's what Renaissance, I mean, that's, from Aristotle on, that's the kind of, well, not really Aristotle himself, but from Aristotle's successors on, that's its sort of theoretical disposition. And so it provides a chance to do this kind of negotiation between this series of cultures at a level that sort of is constitutionally barred from rising to the level of grand, um, of grand political history. Um, and it also, I think, um, there's an interesting tension between the way in which a, the kind of basic narrative of translatio imperii works, in which there's a kind of uncomplicated transfer of, you know, Rome comes after Greece, to trying to think about very early Roman literature, which Renaissance writers on translation and on the vernacular are very interested in, where there's this tension that Roman literature is, in fact, translated from, copied from Greece before even at the same time as Greece has been conquered. And it sort of, it, it, the, the timeline gets, can, gets muddied um, and complicated. Uh, uh, the, and the fact that these plays are, um, are playing with that, that you know, Plautus will call himself a barbarian, um, offers a different set of, of cultural um, paradigms that in some ways bridge that space between translatio, a kind of translatio imperi model and the, the kind of model which people often conceptualize, you know, there, there's vernacular trans, trans, translation, transnational interchange in the early modern period, that that's happening horizontally over these networks, and there's a kind of great vertical tree of translatio uh, imperi. And this, in a sense, provides a kind of an example that people are very aware of, of that horizontality already in the classical tradition. Um, how are relates to the other tradition with, with, with Boccaccio? Um, I mean, the, the other major development for Renaissance comedy is the intertwining of, um, of the, that novella tradition and of, of, of comedy. So right from the, um, from the 15 teens with Machiavelli's Mandragola and Viviana's Calandra, Italian playwrights are sort of incorporating novella material um, into, into their plays. And then when you get to England, many of these, plot, these, these, uh, these plots that you can trace a sort of genetic resemblance back to Roman comedy to actually come from Italian, co are in Italian comedies, and then novellas are sort of based on them, and then those novellas are translated into England in these novella collections, and then they end up back on the English stage. So again, those networks are very um, tangled up. And Boccaccio, of course, is also reading Plautus and Terence. We have his manuscripts, his manuscript Terence is in the, the Laurentiana in Florence. Um, as for what's theatrical about it, in, um, I mean, one thing I would say is that there's, there's a, a way in which this, the movement of texts is, um, there's a constant hope that it's going to be followed by the movement of structures and institutions. Um, Kathleen was, was talking about uh, you know, the, the um, dedication to the um, uh, Sulpicio, um, yes, uh, his, the, this early translation of, of uh, this early edition of Vitruvius, which has this preface saying to Riario, you need to build a theater. Um, and the question of uh, where comedy, is, does comedy belong to the city? is an sort of integral part of the city, is tied up with this question of, of theater building. And Roman comedy provides ways to come at it both ways. The Romans offer this model of a theatrical culture, telling Roman humanists can go see these, um, 
uh, you know, the, the, the ruins of the theory of Marcellus. Um, but on the other hand, the Roman comedies themselves are set somewhere else. They, they perform the foreignness of theater to Rome. And when, in fact, some of the early, it happens that some of the early um, revivals of Roman comedy performed in Rome end up being performed in temporary theaters on the same site that the Romans performed plays in temporary theaters in Republican Rome. I don't know if people are sort of thinking about that, but, it's, but that kind of play between the texts and the institutions is ongoing. Okay. opportunity for questioning, but thank you so much for your <laughs> <laughs>